how Einstein's brain got missing. In the last century, the world of science has recorded major successes across various fields. Notable scientific victories include magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, smallpox eradication, manned spaceflight, and the internet. But for pathologist Thomas Harvey, his dream was to unlock the secrets of geniuses and what granted them that gift. Specifically, he became rather obsessed with unlocking the secrets of the genius of renowned physicist Albert Einstein. Born in Germany on the 14th of March, 1879, Albert grew up to practice theoretical physics, becoming one of the most influential scientists of all time. In 1895, he moved to Switzerland, giving up his German citizenship. He was awarded a PhD in 1905 by the University of Zurich. Einstein traveled to the United States in 1933, the same period Hitler came into power. As a Jew, Einstein opposed the policies created by Hitler's government. He went on to become a citizen of the United States in 1940. Einstein published several notable papers detailing his experiments and discoveries. Perhaps his best-known work was on the theory of relativity, which seeks to explain the relationship between space and time. There are two theories, general relativity and special relativity. He is also credited with having the most famous formula, E equals mc squared. Einstein went on to win the 1921 Nobel Prize in Physics for his services to theoretical physics and especially for his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect. This was a pivotal step in the development of quantum theory. Now, even though the general public had zero clue of what his theory implies, Einstein was a famous figure both in his life and after his death. Sadly, on April 17, 1955, Einstein suffered internal bleeding caused by the rupture of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. He refused surgery and died the following morning. He was 76 years old at the time of his death. During his memorial 10 years later, nuclear physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer, father of the atomic bomb, summarized his impression of Einstein as a person. Einstein was almost wholly without sophistication and wholly without worldliness. There was always with him a wonderful purity at once childlike and profoundly stubborn. According to his wishes, his remains were cremated and the ashes were scattered at an undisclosed location. He made this wish because he didn't want anyone to be tempted to study or worship his body. Based on his achievements and popularity, this wish wouldn't be crazy at all. The bizarre actions of Thomas Stoltz Harvey would prove this. Thomas Harvey was the pathologist who conducted the autopsy on Einstein. He conducted the autopsy at Princeton Hospital on April 18, 1955, at 8 a.m. Einstein's brain was recorded to weigh 1,230 grams, which is a normal weight for a human brain. Harvey secretly took some body parts from Einstein's corpse. He gave the eyeballs to Einstein's eye doctor, Henry Abrams, and kept the brain for himself. At this point, Einstein's family was not aware of this fact. Harvey had the brain sectioned and preserved in up to 240 blocks. The parts were preserved in celloidin, a hard and rubbery form of cellulose, and placed into two jars that Harvey kept in his basement. Harvey would retain most of these blocks for up to 40 years. Harvey kept Einstein's family in the dark about its theft, but eventually they would discover it after reading about it in the papers. Harvey admitted his wish to have informed the family earlier, but he still believed he did the right thing by preserving the brain of the genius, Albert Einstein. Hans Albert, Einstein's son, argued that his father had not specified any study of his remains and that the deceased genius would not have liked the publicity. Harvey apologized for offending the family. However, since Hans Albert had permitted an autopsy, Harvey would exonerate himself from any wrongdoing. To Harvey, standard autopsy procedure included removal of the brain and, in some cases, keeping it. Hospitals frequently retained tissue and organs from the cadavers that passed across their dissecting tables for teaching or their studies. Princeton was no exception. When Hans and Harvey spoke on the phone, Harvey stressed the scientific value of keeping the brain. He wanted to have it examined for anatomical signs of intelligence to see how it might be different from other brains. Although Hans was uncomfortable with the publicity that the project was bound to attract, Harvey made a promise to set Hans' mind at ease. Harvey promised to take good care of the brain and not exploit it or expose it to publicity. Hans would eventually give Harvey reluctant permission to keep the brain. He did this on the condition that the results of the project would only be published in scientific journals and not sensationalized. Other people sought the brains for themselves, including the United States Army. 
The army felt that having it would put them on par with the Russians, who were big on collecting brains at that period. Harvey had failed to publish any findings after many years. A reason may have been that Harvey was not a neurologist, but a pathologist. It was simply not his area of specialty. In 1978, he was tracked down by reporter Stephen Levy. It turned out that Harvey had lost everything since he stole the brain in 1955. Harvey had lost his job at Princeton and his marriage eventually fell apart. He moved to Philadelphia, taking the brain with him. He also traveled to different parts of the world, carrying the parts of the brain with him. Publicity from Levy's story brought attention to Harvey again, 23 years after he had stolen the brain. He was approached for samples by, among others, the neuroanatomist, Marianne Diamond, at the University of California, Berkeley. With the package Diamond received from Harvey by post, the studies of Einstein's brain finally took off. In 1985, Harvey and his collaborators in California published the first study on Einstein's brain. In the study, they claimed that the brain had abnormal proportion of two types of cells, neurons and glial. Diamond had shown that a stimulating environment can lead to an increase in glial cell count. Perhaps the low ratio of neurons to glial cells in Einstein's brain sample reflected a life devoted to the biggest and most stimulating scientific puzzles. The study was followed by five others, reporting additional differences in individual cells or particular structures in Einstein's brain. Flash forward to 1996. Britt Anderson at the University of Alabama at Birmingham published a study on Einstein's prefrontal cortex. He found that the number of neurons was equivalent to brains in a control group, but they were more tightly packed, allowing, perhaps, for faster processing of information. Harvey was back again in 1999. He and Canadian collaborators got Einstein's brain into one of the most prestigious medical journals. Sandra Whittleson from McCaster University in Canada studied Harvey's original photographs of Einstein's brain. Based on the photographs before Einstein's brain was cut, the researchers claimed that Einstein had an abnormal folding pattern in parts of his parietal lobe. The parietal lobe is roughly located at the upper back area of the skull. It is one of the major lobes in the brain. Its function is to process sensory information it receives from the outside world, mainly relating to touch, taste, and temperature. It is the part that is linked to mathematical ability. Another research would arrive in 2012. Anthropologist Dean Falk worked with a set of previously unseen photographs of Einstein's brain taken by Harvey with an Exacta camera. She did a complete audit of the brain, naming every convolution and crevice. She found some unusual features. Falk noted that the most striking feature is that Einstein had an extra ridge on his midfrontal lobe. This is the part responsible for making plans and working memory. Most people have three ridges, but Einstein had four. She also found Einstein's parietal lobes were dramatically asymmetric, and he had a knob on his right motor strip. This feature with the parietal lobes is referred to as the sign of omega. It is associated with musicians who use their left hand. A fact to note is that Einstein was known to play the violin. In 2013, the results of another study were published with Falk's name added to it. This study examined Einstein's corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is a large bundle of more than 200 million myelinated nerve fibers that connect the two brain hemispheres, permitting communication between the right and left sides of the brain. The researchers found Einstein's was thicker than in control groups, suggesting enhanced cooperation between brain hemispheres. However, not everyone agreed with the results of the studies. Professor of Psychology at Pace University, Terence Hines, presented a poster at the Cognitive Neuroscience Society annual meeting outlining how each of Harvey's six studies on Einstein's brain was flawed. In 2014, Hines would liken the results to a confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the tendency to process information by looking for, or interpreting, information that is consistent with one's existing beliefs. Confirmation bias is largely unintentional and often results in ignoring inconsistent information. Hines noted that Harvey had told Levy in 1978 that his initial research conducted on the brain showed it to be within normal limits for a man his age. But Harvey didn't publish these results. Instead, he waited for exceptional differences to turn up, differences worthy of a genius. Other factors could have caused the presence of the sign of omega in Einstein's brain. 
Einstein was bilingual and musical. The speech delays he experienced in childhood led experts to believe that he was somewhat autistic. In 2007, Thomas Harvey died at the University Medical Center at Princeton due to complications of a stroke. Harvey was known to have offered slices of the brain to other researchers, many of whom have returned them. After Harvey's death, his heirs transferred the remains of Albert Einstein's brain to the National Museum of Health and Medicine, including 14 photographs of the whole brain. Recently, the Mütter Museum in Philadelphia acquired 46 small portions of Einstein's brain. Segments of the brain went on exhibit in the museum's permanent galleries in 2013.